think you should listen to your intuition always, especially as artists. This has to be something you care so much about you're willing to do for the rest of your life, regardless of whether you're a, a quote-unquote success, whether or not it gets hard, whether or not you lose relationships over it, you know, whether or not you're called selfish or bad because of it. I mean, this is a passion. This is a calling, no different than if God calls you to go out and preach on the streets for the rest of your life as a child. It's a calling. I do believe that. People think I'm sappy to say that. But I do truly, honestly believe that. I was born uh, in northeastern Alabama, and uh, my stepfather was a Southern Baptist minister who uh, started preaching at a very young age. He had lost his arms on a bet where he had climbed a pole and was shot so badly that they had to amputate his arms. Uh, he died for a few moments and saw God, and God told him that he should dedicate his life to preaching. So he became sort of an acclaimed child preacher throughout Tennessee and Alabama and Mississippi. And uh, later on, as time went on, and sort of we entered into the period of Reagan economics and it got really tight, and my stepfather was, we were poor, and uh, he began preaching at multiple churches. And I would help him. I started out just by helping him with the services. I would stand up, I would read verses, I would lead sections, and then it got to the point where I would actually, uh, the evening services, I would actually lead the services by the time I was like nine and ten years old. So I really was sort of a child who almost apprenticed to a preacher. But really, as, as I think oftentimes happens, especially when you're young, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's more like a job. You, it's something you do. It's an act that you do with your father. And so I don't believe it was ever truly real to me. I mean, I believed in God and I believed in Christ, but I didn't really commit myself, you know, to the religion. And so after my stepfather and my mother divorced, I went on and sort of went to school. And I'd always drawn and made work when I was growing up, uh, particularly drawing, a little bit of painting. And I followed a, a, a woman who would eventually be my wife to University of Texas and started taking some art classes just because I didn't, there was nothing else I think, thought I could do. And uh, really sort of fell in love with it. And there I met a gentleman who came through uh, giving lectures. His name was, uh, he's a critic named Dave Hickey. And Dave liked what I was doing. And at the time I was mainly making just sort of abstract painting. And... Uh, then I, he said, well, you should come to Vegas, and I laughed. I said, you know, Vegas. I'd never even been to Las Vegas. You know, I'd just always been told it was this sort of den of sin. You know, it was like Satan's playground. And so I definitely, you know, even though I, I wasn't a staunch, I, I hadn't sort of rediscovered my faith at that point, I still was nervous. That sort of lingered in the back of my mind, this idea of this sort of adult playground not being the place I would necessarily want to go. But... Needless to say, Dave was sort of pushy, and uh, I, I flew to Las Vegas in the middle of the night, and I landed, and I took a cab from the airport, and I got out on the strip, and there was an Elvis convention in town, and the first thing I saw were two Elvis impersonators holding hands, walking down the street, and it was just, I, I felt like I had stepped in a David Lynch movie or something, and so I called my wife, it was like, and I began to sort of combine uh, the practice of art and the practice of religion. Over time, I really decided that the two were very much the same, that the act of, of, of preaching and the act, uh, the act of sermonizing about having faith is very akin to, to the, the process of making art. I mean, if you think about it, basically both ministers and artists both deal with trying to make visible the invisible, trying to sort of make unknown, knowable the unknown. And um, it really began to sort of click for me. In particular, there, in particularly, there was a verse in 2 Corinthians that says we are all fools for Christ's sake that really, really struck home with me. The idea of being a holy fool, the idea of sort of humiliating yourself in front of God to show that your supreme devotion to God. In doing research, I, I discovered, too, that there was this huge history. And that was the point where my religious practice, sermonizing, began to change. And I began because... The work at that point, the art I was making, really dealt with a lot of vinyl and sort of popular pop cultural images, trying to bring them in to sort of use as metaphor to sort of talk about religious ideas. 
And uh, it just seemed natural for me to start bringing that into the sermons, too. And so I began making costumes where I would do uh, sermons as Ultraman or Superman or Judy Garland, like I do one where I'm dressed like Judy Garland from The Wizard of Oz and talk about taking the, you know, the path that leads to hell is paved with gold. And, you know, you, you sort of, and, and also then meeting these sort of characters that sort of help you along the way and sort of teach you. And so the, the, there became a lot more sort of absurdity.